When I went to my Google coding interview, I solved three out of five problems using recursion. A few weeks later, Google sent me a $300,000 offer. Yeah, recursion literally made the difference. But here's the thing, when you first try to learn it, your brain just melts. You can't picture what's actually happening inside. So I made this video with beautiful animations and the simplest explanation possible. So you'll finally get recursion. And once you do, you'll be able to crack any coding problem and then land your own offer from Google Meta or OpenAI. Hi, I'm Sheldon, an ex-Googler, been 10 years in software engineering, and I help you easily prep for coding interviews on this channel. In any programming language, you can create functions, blocks of code that run several commands. For example, in an app like Uber, there might be a function called request ride that books you a trip. Functions can take parameters and return results back to the outside world. And inside a function, you can write anything, including calls to other functions. And I'm sure you already know all that. But here's an interesting question. If you have a function and it can call other functions, what happens if it calls itself? like literally writing its own name inside its body. This situation is called recursion, but why would you ever need it? And why does everyone keep talking about it? The truth is you already use it even in real life without noticing. Imagine you've got a folder on your computer and you know there's a file inside where 10 years ago, you saved the password to a crypto wallet with a thousand bitcoins and you just remembered it now. So yeah, that file is kind of a big deal. You need to find it. If you searched manually, you'd open the folder and read each file name in order. We're looking for a file called secret password. Not this one, not this one either. But luckily, there's another folder inside, so there's still hope. You go into it, and again, a few files. You check their names one by one. Notice what you're doing, the exact same steps as in the previous folder. And if you still don't find the file but see yet another subfolder, you'll enter it and do the same thing again. Check file names just like before. Eventually, you find the file and become ultra rich. Now, if each folder had lots of files, you'd probably write a function to speed things up. It could look like this. You give it the folder to search and the target file name. Then you iterate over everything in that folder and compare each file's name to the one you want, just as you did it manually before. But what do you do when you hit a subfolder? Manually, you'd go into it and repeat the same steps. So in code, we do the same. But if we wrote a brand new function for each subfolder, it would look identical to the first one. So why keep writing the same function over and over if it's literally a copy of the original logic? We want to reuse it and avoid duplicating code. How do we do that? We call the same function and pass the right parameters, the subfolder and the same target file name. And that function will do exactly what we need. Its steps are scan all entries and check their names inside the provided folder. But when do we make that call for the inner folder? We called the first function at the very beginning when we started our search. But the inner folder only becomes known inside that function while it's running. So where do we run the search for it? Right inside the function itself. We're basically saying, if you encounter a folder during the search, run the same search inside that subfolder. That's literally calling the same function from within itself, because the steps are the same. Now, let's break down exactly how this works, step by step. If you ever want to land a job at Google or Meta, recursion is absolutely crucial. But there are a few other coding techniques you must master too. So what should you learn first? What can wait? And what's the most effective interview prep roadmap for you personally? To make it easy, I've built a free three minute quiz. Take it and you'll get a personalized roadmap with all the key algorithm topics, including really simple lessons, practice problems, and even hour by hour estimates to help you prep faster and smarter. With this plan, you could be ready to apply to Fang in just a few weeks and get your 300 grand offer. Click the link in the description and grab your full roadmap for free. We start by running our search function for the very first time, using the top level folder. It takes the list of everything inside and loops through it. First file, check the name, doesn't match. So the loop moves on. Second file, again, no match. Keep going. Then we hit a folder. The code checks if it's a folder, run the search inside it. And to do that, it literally calls the same function again, this time passing the subfolder as the argument, because that's where we need to search now. 
At that moment, your computer starts running the same function a second time while the first one is put on pause exactly at the line where the call happened. The second call works the same way, but since the parameters are different, the computer now performs all those actions inside this new folder you passed here. It goes through all the files there, checking their names. And let's say it doesn't find the one we want, so that search ends. What happens now? The second function call finishes, but your computer remembers where it came from. It knows it was called from the previous function, with its own parameters. When the inner call completes, the pause on that line ends, and execution of the first function continues right from that exact point. The computer remembers that it already processed part of the files, and knows exactly where it left off. So it picks up from there, checks the next file, its name finally matches, and boom, you're a billionaire. But the really cool thing about recursion is that it can go very deep. Imagine a folder inside a folder, inside another folder, and so on. A whole chain of nested directories. Our recursive function can handle that perfectly. We start with the top folder on the first call. Inside it, there's another folder, so the function calls itself again. The computer pauses the first call and runs the second. Inside that, another folder, another call, and the previous one pauses again. And for every new folder, a new call is added. But the computer still remembers all the previous ones, their parameters, where they paused, and what they've already done. All that information for every function call is stored in what's called a stack. On the top, the most recent call, and at the bottom, the very first one. When the latest call finishes, it's removed from the stack and control returns to the previous one, which continues right where it paused. Once that one finishes, it's popped off too, and the next one resumes, and so on. So, every new recursive call adds information to the top of the stack. The deeper the recursion, the larger the stack becomes. But as calls finish, they're popped off, one by one, until eventually we return to the very first call that wraps up the whole program. And your computer maintains this call stack automatically. You don't have to write anything extra. Each time a function is called, the computer adds its info to the stack its parameters, its progress, and the exact place where it stopped. And that's why recursion is such a powerful and elegant tool. The stack keeps track of everything for you. When one call finishes, the next continues with all its parameters and right from the correct spot. All that just because you called the same function inside itself. One line of code, and you've got one of the most beautiful mechanisms in programming. My main goal with these videos is simple, to make complex topics crystal clear using amazing visuals and super simple explanations. If this video helps you learn coding or prepare for interviews, please subscribe. That way I'll know I need to make more deep dives like this and you'll never miss them when they drop. Thanks a lot. But when should you actually use recursion? Because honestly, regular loops seem way more intuitive and simple, so why not just use loops all the time? In our file search example, we're looping through the folder contents, and that works great. But the moment we hit a nested folder, things get tricky. We also need to go inside it and check all its files. So we could load its contents and restart the loop to go through them. We'd reset the loop variable and start iterating over the new folder. Seems fine so far. But once that inner loop finishes, we can't go back to the previous folder. We've lost all information about its remaining files and where we left off because we reset the index. That means the whole previous context is gone. And what if the file with a thousand bitcoins was right there in one of those unprocessed files? That's a disaster. Sure, you could fix this with a loop too. You just have to manually create a stack. And before restarting the loop for a subfolder, you'd push all the current state info into that stack. Then after finishing the subfolder, you'd pop the previous state back and resume. But just look at that code. So many lines, complicated logic for saving and restoring states. It's harder to read and much easier to break. One tiny bug could literally cost you a thousand bitcoins. Now look at our recursive code. It's a hundred times simpler, shorter, and more intuitive. No extra data structures, no complex logic. It literally describes what you do by hand. You open a folder and you look through its files. That's exactly what the code says, and it's crystal clear. 
Unlike the loop version where you get buried in technical details and lose the big picture. That's why recursion is perfect for cases where the same type of action repeats, but you also need to preserve the context of previous steps and return to it easily. You can do that with loops in a manual stack as we saw, but recursion gives you that behavior out of the box. The stack management happens automatically, which means fewer chances to mess things up. And situations like this are everywhere. Recursion works great for nested structures like folders, but for example, in a flight app like Skyscanner, recursion could help figure out how to get from New York to Amsterdam. All cities are connected by available flights. That's basically a graph. Such a function could take the departure city and the destination, then it would go through all available flights from the starting city. If the destination isn't found, it could recursively search from the next city and see where you can go from there. If that path doesn't work, it would return to the previous city and check other routes. Step by step, it would eventually find a valid path. Besides, you can find even the one with the fewest layovers. Since recursion is so important in real-world problems, it also shows up all the time in big tech coding interviews. So if you're preparing on LeetCode, here are a few common patterns that instantly tell you, yep, this one can be solved with recursion. First, self-similar substructures. If the problem can be broken down into smaller copies of itself, that's recursion. For example, take a binary tree. Any part of it is also a binary tree. So you just write a solution for one small part and then recursively call it to handle the rest. Second, find all possible paths problems. Just like our flight example earlier, if you need to find every possible way to get from New York to Amsterdam, you start recursion from the departure city and explore all routes until you hit the destination. It's basically a graph traversal, and there are dozens of those on LeetCode. They're super popular in interviews. Third, dependency on smaller sub-problems. For example, the classic staircase problem, where you can climb either one or two steps at a time. It can be solved recursively because each step depends on the result of the smaller ones before it. Although recursion isn't the most efficient solution for this particular problem, you'll see why soon, it's still a common and useful way to think about it. So the way, that staircase problem is part of dynamic programming, and recursion plays a huge role there. So if you'd like a detailed breakdown of dynamic programming techniques explained this simply, hit the like button. If we get 3k likes, I'll make that video next. But recursion has one important nuance. When we keep calling our search for the Bitcoin file function again and again, diving deeper into the folder tree, each new call gets added to the top of the call stack in the computer's memory. This stack literally lives in RAM. The more recursive calls we make, the larger that stack becomes. That means recursion uses memory to operate, and the deeper it goes, the more memory it consumes. If you have 10 nested folders, the stack will hold up to 10 calls. If you have a thousand folders, that's a thousand calls. So the memory usage grows linearly with the depth of the folder tree. In other words, the space complexity of this recursive solution is O of H, where H is the height or depth of the folder structure. And that's super important. Recursion always contains an implicit stack. Even if it looks like you're not creating any additional data structures, memory is still being used. So it's crucial to always evaluate the space complexity of recursive code. Remember this rule. If there's recursion, carefully count the space complexity. Also, RAM on your computer is finite, which means if you make too many recursive calls, you can run out of memory. When that happens, your program crashes with a stack overflow exception. That's why every recursive function must have at least one base case, a condition where recursion stops and the program starts returning results. In our folder example, there are two such conditions. The first, if we find the target file, we return its name. Each previous call in the stack receives it and returns it further up, because there's no point in continuing once we found what we were looking for. The stack unwinds quickly. The second, if we reach the end of the file list without finding the target, the function returns null, meaning not found. That call then gets removed from the stack. 
But if you write a function that just keeps calling itself without any exit condition, the calls will quickly overflow the stack, causing an error because there's no mechanism to stop recursion and free up memory. That's exactly why recursion isn't always the most efficient solution. It's perfect for problems like searching through nested folders. But for something like counting how many ways you can reach the top of a staircase by taking one or two steps at a time, recursion, while elegant, has a cost. It's just a few lines of code, sure, but the space complexity is O of H, where H is the height of the staircase, again, because of that hidden stack. Besides, it does plenty of redundant calculations, so the time complexity here is O of 2 to the power of H, which is quite poor. The optimal solution, though, uses a simple loop instead. It achieves the same result, but with constant space complexity and linear time. That's a slightly smarter approach from dynamic programming. Everything we've talked about so far is more than enough to start using recursion anywhere, solve any leet code problem, and even pass a Google interview. But now, let's go one level deeper. Let's see how the call stack actually works in memory. Because understanding that gives you the deepest possible grasp of recursion. Your computer's RAM is basically a big grid of memory cells, bytes. Each cell has a unique address, and you can access it by that address. Inside, it stores some value, usually a number. When you create a variable in your code, the computer allocates a few consecutive bytes in memory for it, for example, 4 bytes for an integer, and stores the variable's value there. But in binary form, just zeros and ones. Now, the call stack in memory is just another continuous block of these bytes. Every time you call a function, a chunk of this memory is reserved for it. Some bytes for the first parameter, some for the second, some for local variables, and so on. This entire chunk of memory, all the data about that one specific function call, is called a stack frame. And the address of its last byte is stored in a pointer. That's what marks the top of the stack, the point in memory where the current stack ends. That pointer's value is stored in one of the CPU registers. Now, when another recursive call happens, the stack simply allocates a new sequence of bytes for this new call, again storing all its variables and parameters. There's also a special cell that remembers the exact line of code in the previous call where the program should return after this one finishes. Then, the pointer moves forward, marking the new top of the stack. So now, memory holds both function calls, each with all their own data. When the recursive call completes, the stack pointer moves backward to the end of the previous frame. And since the memory still contains the address of the line where that previous function should continue, then that call can wake up and resume right from that exact spot, using all its previous variable values. Meanwhile, the finished call is effectively removed from the stack, since it lies beyond the pointer. The more calls we make, the more memory cells get reserved for them. And when each call finishes, we return back one level at a time until we reach the very first call. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel. I regularly post clear and simple algorithm breakdowns with visuals just like this one. Hope you found it helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.